Hello, everyone. So uh, today we're going to be starting our second round of lightning talks. Um, so, uh, so like before, these are going to be five minute talks. We have uh, eight of them today. Um, and uh, I will send uh, uh, little messages or reminders over the chat to the speaker um, when you get to like maybe the three or four minute mark. Um, and then might have to uh, uh, be a little more vocal if you go too far over. Um, but with that said, uh, we're going to be, um, Russell Moreland is going to be kicking us off with a talk about ray casting in Snap. Okay, so everyone can hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, so here I have. I'm talking about raycasting today. So what is raycasting? So I guess um, it, can, it can be two-dimensional as well. Um, the idea, the reason I'm here was last year um, when the ray length block was introduced, I think that was a pretty clever demo. Um, if you weren't there, with the ray length block, we can make a sort of 3D environment. However, it's still a 2D environment. It doesn't have floor and ceiling heights. Um, originally, I planned to iterate that on by adding just the floor and ceiling heights. But I eventually decided to just make each pixel its own ray, um, since that can be done efficiently. And it is, uh, it also lets you do pretty much anything. It's actually a full renderer. Um, so, so how does ray casting work? So essentially we have, if we're trying to find, uh, yeah, we've got, we have an object. I'm just doing it in two dimensions. And we want to figure out how, the rays would interact with that. So if I create a ray, um, then we have an input to it, which is the distance. So that's actually the thing that defines the object in this case is the distance. So distance from the origin of that ray to the object looks like that. Then we can just step the ray forwards until it gets there. And it can't possibly overshoot because uh, well, it's that distance. So it's always at least that distance in every direction. Um, where am I? And then we don't need that anymore. And then we just do it again until we get to the object. So that explanation, <laughs> it's not perfect. Um, here's my actual code. So there's the main block here, which I think it takes a distance estimator. Um, I'll use the top one. Uh, it takes the camera position, it takes the direction, and it takes the sun. So it, not much is happening right here. We just find what is forwards to the right and upwards. Basically just finding, and then we use the this block from the Big Pixels library, because yes, I built this on top of the Big Pixels library. Um, and then we use, but, but really it's just finding a bunch of rays using the next block which is color of ray. Um, so it, within color of ray, there's a lot of things, but the most important part is just the very start. So it, first it normalizes the direction and the direction towards the sun. That's not too important. Uh, it, then it checks the distance to the object using the distance function in the do until, so it finds the distance. Then it steps forward by that much, and then it increases the complexity by a little bit. So that's used for ambient occlusion, which is part of the lighting calculations. And it's actually something that ray casting is very good at. Uh, it's not something you use otherwise. And it's not that important, though. So essentially, you just move forward by the distance, find what the distance is using an input to this function, step forward by that much. And then if it's less than 1 or greater than 4,040, 4,096, um, then it just counts it as nothing. So if it's, then you see the rest of it. So if it's less than one, then it hits the object and we still have a bunch of things to do. If it's greater than 4,096, we just give it a cyan sky texture. Well, not texture, a color. Um, okay, but if it does hit the object, we're not finished, as you can tell, because it still has to have a light value. Um, I did actually pillow shade, make, make, make a pillow shaded version, and you can see an example of that, um, which I guess should be part of examples, but I believe it is 
that. That is, obviously it's pillar shaded, but it doesn't really look like anything. Um, it is actually a sphere, but you can't really tell, which is why we need proper lighting. So the next thing is, well, it essentially just makes another ray, but this time the direction is towards the sun. Um, and hopefully my mouse is visible, but it's just that step block. Um, again, it's the same thing, but there's one more element, which is slope. So it doesn't need to be there necessarily. Well, it does, it, but if it didn't, then it would only be able to detect if, if it was in the sun or if it wasn't. But if you actually have an object, and I'll show the proper render so you can see, um, you can see that in the front, for example, uh, that there is, can see the sun from there, but it's not just pure white because it's at an angle. So that's what the slope does, but it actually has two functions because as you can tell, it calculates the minimum slope over the entire array. Now that, that is used for just uh, things that are somewhat slanted, but it's also used for to make soft shadows. You don't need to worry about that too much, but lighting is a bit more. And then ambient inclusion, basically the number of steps in the, then we have the number of steps in the first part is used. So I spent way too long. Yeah, Anyways, so what I'm we're, trying to say is, over. yeah, I'll, I'll show you a few more of my renders. Um, I created that one, created that one with a bunch more. Then I created a cube, and that's the thing it's good for. It's good for fractals. It's a bit faster. It's still too slow to run in Snap, though, at the moment, so there will be some optimization to do. And, yeah, I'm sorry it took too long. <laughs> no, very cool demos. Um, did you make this uh, some of these projects available in the uh, on the forums? There's a site for that. Uh, no, I haven't done that yet. I, I can't. That would be awesome. These are these are very cool demos. Thank you, Russell. Um, so uh, next, um, we're going to be hearing from Ken Khan from Oxford, um, who's going to be talking about using machine learning models created in Google's Teachable Machine in Snap. So Ken, okay. you have the floor. All right, hello everybody. Um, so <clears throat> I'll start by showing you um, Google's Teachable Machine, which um, now I have to figure out which, uh, there's so many tabs and I have to get the right one here. Um, oh, there it is. <clears throat> which Google um, came out with about four years ago and did a major update about a year ago and the idea is you could train it to either uh, with the camera to distinguish different categories or through the microphone different sounds or different words and it also has some poses sorts of things and they they really documented it really well with lots of examples and tutorials and videos and then a lot of fun examples of what people have done with this so um, if I um, launch it here, if I, where was it? There it is, get started. <clears throat> I'll do an image project. And I could say something here like uh, left. And um, I think I better turn off my camera because it's going to need my camera. Uh, sorry. So I'll stop video. So if I uh, train it with my, let's say my left hand, and I click on this, and I move it around a bit and but forward and backwards, so it gets a you know a few hundred different ideas of what my left hand looks like, and then I could do the same thing for my right hand, and then I did a third one which was with no hands at all, and then when I clicked training in about after about five minutes, it uh, uh, had, uh, this is very annoying. The, um, <coughs> the Zoom interface was covering things up here. Um, so <coughs> here's, here's what I ended up uh, training. If I turn this on now. 
Ah, for some reason, it's, oh, maybe this is still holding on to the camera, sorry. I think uh, yeah, I'll delete that. Right, good. So if I show my left hand, it says left, pretty confident. If I show my right hand, if I move everything, it's, it's normal uh, here. So let's look now at, at, oh, and so you get a URL. This is actually the URL up here. That's your own model. So this block that I have gets a uh, prediction from a costume. And um, I made of an image in an audio version. There was some problems with the pose version because they were um, yeah, different versions of things. So I just pasted in the URL that, that the teacher machine gave me. And if I click on this right now, it might actually work. Uh, what I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna move this over here because I could see better. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what it's actually saying is <laughs> that it's not getting the camera. So maybe I'll try again here. Ah, very annoying. So what's happened, it, this is one of the annoying things about demos here, which is that the uh, every all these different things want the camera. Zoom wants it, the, the teacher machine. And I, even though I closed the teacher machine, so I'm going to see if just refreshing this page, uh, I'll be able to get the camera now. Oh, the usual uh, new feature here. So <laughs> it's uh, loading all the models and code that you need. And uh, so it's it's saying that the normal, which, and if I put my hand here, we can see that it's the left hand. So it's working just fine. And here's a little example of, of using it in, um, here, I'm going to turn off the video. Yeah, what your uh, your screen sharing seems to be frozen. Oh, 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 I know because I ended up. Is it better now? Uh -huh. Yes, better now. Right. OK, thanks for. So uh, what you missed, well, just do it over again, is basically it, it comes back with a little table and that saying that normal is 99.99% because it didn't see a hand. And now if I put my hand up, it says left hand and so on. So here's a, a, a program that grabs an image from the camera, shows it, but actually shows it small just for fun. And then the respond to classification is a very simple little demo thing where if, if right is more than 50% confident, then it turns right. And if it's a left hand, then it turns left. And if it's neither hand, then it goes forward and just does this uh, forever. So if I go like this, it's, it's turning left. And if I move it away, it goes forward. And if I put the other hand, it turns the other way. And if I drop back and it's really um, very open-ended, all the kinds of things you could do with this. Uh, like I said, you could do sounds, but you could, <clears throat> you, you could have it, you know, the traditional thing of telling cats from dogs or different sounds. Um, and, and students could use this also if, if in a science project where they've, they've trained it to recognize different kinds of leaves or flowers or different bird songs and then build an application based on that. So that's pretty much what I wanted to uh, show. Um, nice, very cool. So we are a, a bit over, um, but it was a very cool demo. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I, mean, I especially enjoy watching it uh, watching you steer it by using your hands <laughs> and gestures. That's very cool. <laughs> right. I should say, but the one last thing is that, that, that if you're for one of the things motivates a lot of students is helping disabled people. And this is obviously a way to make interfaces that maybe you just take a head movement or some kind of sound as an interface. But go on, yeah, I'll cool. stop sharing here. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, next, we have uh, Yoshiki, and he'll be talking about an implementation of multiplayer real-time collaboration for SNAP. 
Boris Hello. Is Hello, you can, can you hear me? Oui. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Yoshiki Oshima and I have been playing with Snap on and off for a long time. Oh, I should share my screen. Here you go. Uh, sharing my screen. So let's see. So you can see my screen, right? And so I, a few years ago, I was experimenting to add a collaborative feature to Snap. And this is a paper on that idea. And so the idea here was to use the standard network feature of the browser called WebRTC. And the, it was, it's basically like screen share, but uh, then on top of the screen share where you send like, the screen to other people, you know, remote participants, the remote participants user event can be sent back to the first client. So you have uh, the this illusion of shared real-time collaboration. And the WebRTC allows a peer-to-peer -peer connection. And the, it's great when it works. So it's a real fast connection, but over the years, the internet got more strict about sharing and it, peer-to-peer -peer connection often fails. So I reworked the network part of the system a little bit and the, made it a little bit more robust. So that's what I'm going to show today. And so let's go to a snap page like this. And the, yeah, this is just a snap so I can move my triangle. Oh, okay. And then I can add a turn and it goes a little bit, uh, goes forward a little bit and turn a little bit. Or maybe I can stack, oh, so I can stack those blocks more and it goes more, but let's say I don't know how to make my turtle go in a circle and I'm stuck here. But here, actually, yeah, I can send, um, so I, but I have a super snap programmer friend called Bernard and he can help me. Oh yeah, don't do that yet, <laughs> it's okay. So uh, I was going to ask Bernard that, yeah, how do I make my turtle go in circle? And they let's, yeah, he already did it, but basically he can do it to, he and I can do stuff together. Yeah, he made it go like that. So I, I am moving my when space key pressed, and now Bernard might click on his space bar. Yeah, maybe stop this, and Bernard can press his space bar and the, the script moves. So anybody who has tried to teach Snap remotely and you get the frustration, you see somebody's screen and you keep saying, oh, you know, click on this card block from the top that says, like forward a move, but no, 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 not that one, the other one, and you know, it's frustrating. But here I can see his cursor or somebody else joined and the, he can see my cursor and the, both of us can do stuff together. And also let's say we want to paint together and I can paint something here. Yeah, Bernard can draw a line. Yeah, go ahead and draw a line first. So we can paint together. But also let's say I want to draw a rainbow line. And so I move my pen, but Bernard is scrubbing on the color palette. So if I move and he moves, my line is rainbow color. So that's sort of the power of the real time collaboration system. And the, yeah, sorry, I'm not, reading the chat if I miss the questions. Sorry, but so the, uh, yeah, so this is, so Snap is modified a little bit to support um, um, multiple cursors, but not much. And the also, uh, yeah, so yeah, that's my basically the demo. And the, so to recap here, um, so how you can try this, so basically go to this website and then the URL changes to get a question mark Q equal blah, blah, blah. And the, 
if you send that URL to your friend and then they can, you can get into the same session. And if you don't have a friend, you can open that you know, in the new tab and you can have two windows side by side for yourself. And the, the paper I mentioned is available here and the source code is also available here. And the, actually to make it robust, it's costing a little bit money for me. So I may not be keeping this for a long time, but if you have funding and you have some money, you can set up your own installation and use this. Yeah, so thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you, Yoshiki. This is very cool. Is there time for any questions? Uh, I think we do questions at the end. Okay. Um, yeah, later, later. I'd be worried that would be cut too much into the next one. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, next, we'll be hearing from uh, Daniel Jackson from University of Maine uh, at Farmington. And he'll be talking about SNAP for rich tasks in K-16 math education. So Daniel, you have the floor. There you are. All right. Well, thank you very much. Just uh, share my screen. OK. So. Um, well, uh, so this is a story about uh, rich tasks in, in, in math and, and, and rich tasks is like low floor, high ceiling type of activity uh, where kind of uh, takes, it doesn't take a lot to get into it, but there's um, lots of different avenues of inquiry that can take uh, lots of different forms and you can get into uh, kind of higher level things and uh, it's for kind of uh, engaging lots of different types of students. And so um, this is about a, a number line app uh, that's a, written in SNAP um, that EDC has been working on and they've got some others, but this one's uh, developed for grade two students. And uh, it's kind of meant to uh, practice, well, uh, practice arithmetic types of activities through coding. Um, so for example, here we start at zero and add three, three times. Of course, we just see the numbers that we mark out. Um, and so my daughter played around with this and got her her uh, online math class uh, involved in this as well. And so they use this app uh, as part of their kind of fun activity time. Uh, and uh, the, the students didn't individually use this, but the, uh, the teacher drove it and, and was kind of just asking students what would happen, what if. And so it was a, a good way to get students into coding as well as uh, testing their uh, kind of keeping their arithmetic, uh, mental arithmetic skills up. And so uh, the, the exploration five, though, it was uh, more challenging than, than the others. And so that was uh, labeling all the numbers zero to 10, just using uh, threes and fives. And so, um, well, my daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, brought that to her older sister, who's in grade six. And well, she uh, kind of got into this and she's done some block programming. So this was familiar to her, but uh, the, the math behind it was, was puzzling her. And so, uh, well, she got my wife into it as well, but uh, my youngest daughter, about a half hour later says, hey, I figured this out, much to my surprise. Uh, and well, here was dot solution, uh, <clears throat> start at zero, start at one, start at two. Uh, not exactly what, uh, <laughs> what was intended. Um, so uh, Lily said, no, that's not good. And, and well, she had some uh, other ideas and kind of had been playing around and, you know, if you, add three, subtract five, and kind of mess around a little bit, you can eventually cycle through. Uh, turns out you can't just stick with zero through 10. You do have to kind of leave that set to be able to complete the task. Um, another way we kind of uh, talked about was if you can just add one uh, overall, then you know how to go from zero to one, two, and three, and so on. Kind of a, a recursive process. and. Well, uh, we don't actually have to do that 11 times, as it turns out, uh, we kind of have a nice sewing together uh, of a zero through 10 eventually. Um, and so does, the story doesn't stop here. I, I teach uh, college math and uh, I brought this to my college geometry course and, and they are, we're all, we're all our future high school teachers and they latch right onto this. The, the, the plus one idea was something that 
they uh, they jumped into and could think of lots of different ways to, to add one with threes and fives. Um, kind of higher level uh, math that came up was you know optimization. What's the minimum number of blocks that we would need to complete this task? Uh, and how would we prove that? You know, so we kind of have application as well as theory tied in here. Um, the number theory, uh, you know, what's so special about three and five? Well, it, I mean, it turns out they're relatively prime, and so we can we can write it one as a combination of those two numbers, and that kind of what makes the whole game work. And that even ties into uh, abelian group theory. And so just a couple of theorems that the students had pointed out that they thought kind of tied into this this activity uh, are, are listed here. And there's the ones a combination of of three and five and um, you can understand the, the structure of, say, the uh, integers mod Z15 uh, just by looking at how threes and fives add and subtract. Uh, so, all right, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That was very cool. Um, it's uh, funny to see how the same platform can be used for uh, uh, people in like uh, elementary school, middle school, and then going a bit deeper uh, in college. It's awesome. Right. Yeah. I and mean, this is a geometry class. So right after this, we jumped into using the full scratch to, and, and turtle to, to draw all kinds of patterns. It was uh, you know, completely improvised. Very cool. Lots of fun. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, it looks like next we have um, Louise uh, presenting uh, insights of making STEAM workshops for kids with block coding. Luis, you have the floor. Hey there, can you hear me? Perfect. Yep, now I can. Okay, Great. thank you. Sorry. Okay, uh, well, uh, I'm more a kind of user of Snap. <laughs> uh, uh, and well, uh, here in Yucatan, Mexico, uh, since uh, uh, some years ago, uh, we start to uh, research or uh, and explore a lot of uh, STEAM and STEM and all that kind of uh, <laughs> topics uh, for improve some some uh, activities uh, and uh, on an after school uh, way. So well, I start to work at, at Fab Lab Yucatan, and yeah, you as maybe you you may know the uh, Fab Lab uh, work with uh, digital fabrication, uh, but also you can work uh, with electronics. Uh, coding, uh, and, and yeah, in some cases, uh, you can work with uh, design of, of activities. Uh, and all of this we, we make with, uh, with, this, with the point or the objective of, of the service of being, of being, of being better people, uh, what, whatever the, the does can mean for everyone. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we start with, uh, with some, uh, well, the, the Fab Lab co community also has his networks and also share their their uh, designs and their products. And uh, yeah, we start to explore in all of this. Uh, and I'm personal, personally, I get engaged with the with the code block, the code blocking or or the or this uh, kind of code. Uh, and well, I I start to explore and. And to deploy uh, some some manuals or materials here. Uh, also, we we start to test with with groups uh, what what is uh, actually uh, applying to our context. And yeah, well, we are right now working in some some kind of of uh, materials in Spanish. Uh, also, it's not just just translate some materials that. You can find it on internet because uh, we work with uh, some tools like the the GSP Trend 32 uh, processor and and that kind of things and we have to uh, re uh, recon you know rebuild these uh, these materials. Uh, uh, yeah, for example, we made this uh, this 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 program uh, the Inventor Serious Play. <laughs> well, I don't know if. Is if Lego is is here for something, <laughs> but yeah, uh, we like that that concept, and we start to make uh, this kind of uh, methodology where you can build a circuit, you code uh, with microblocks, and after that, you we explore some uh, questions of some some things you can 
uh, you know, it's like uh, just do it, do the work, and after that, let's uh, reflect about uh, what we made. Uh, and also the last uh, uh, program be, we made, it, it was a, an online course called Reto Ciudad Sostenible. That is something like a sustainable city challenge. <laughs> and yeah, we start also this, uh, this some, some, some insights we, we have gotten from uh, teaching uh, and working with this uh, kind of tools is like, for example, as you can see in, in the, the images, for example, and an step-by-step -step displaying of the blocks process also was helpful for us in some cases. Uh, and yeah, here, for example, is more like a collaborative knowledge construction of the, well, uh, of, of the topics. And also we, we, don't, we don't say, oh, well, this is the knowledge, the more that was kind of dialogue, dialogue. With, uh, with kids from eight to uh, 14 years. Uh, and yeah, in the process, in all these years, we, we have, we've been working here. Uh, we, we, ha we have found uh, some important variables in our learning designs. For example, how much your activity produces and how much con consumes or, or the participant, how much the participant consumes or how much the participant produce how much follow instructions or how much solve ch challenge, uh, how much work as patronists or with patterns or how much uh, works with stories and dramatists, uh, how much work with uh, wide or narrow tools, how much does he know or, how, or what does he doesn't, he or she doesn't know uh, and what or also how much does he or she know his interest or, or know his interest? Uh, all those kind of questions or variables, we always uh, have take, taken when we, de when we design or we deploy some, some activities. And I, uh, I think this, uh, I, I, will, I, I would like to take this opportunity just to say, I don't know, maybe just say thank you for, for build uh, and give access to, for these new tools that allows continue our work in many better ways. And in Maya, is is a traditional language here, is Jumbo Tic. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Luis. Um, it's, really, it's always really cool to see all the different areas that are using SNAP and the creative ways that they're using SNAP. It's, it's, it's really exciting. Um, so next we have uh, Alexandra. Uh, presenting an implementation review of SNAP self-learning course. All right, with that, uh, you have the floor. Yes, hello, hello, good evening. Okay, I'm just starting with my <clears throat> uh, presentation. Just a moment, please. Okay, I hope you see my presentation. Um, and today I would like to uh, present a very short review of my research for of the last three years. I'm working Heidelberg at the University of Education and the work, um, I worked the last three years on a learning course um, in a dis interdisciplinary context. Um, the idea was to make a course to improve computational thinking uh, for the beginners and the better way even uh, the better way in interdisciplinary context. Uh, so the central task of my research was the development of kind of visualized smart city simulation. And today I would like uh, to show you my research way and to show you one of the latest versions of the course. It's not the end because I would like to end my course this year, but uh, it is still one of the, uh, but it's the, um, almost the latest version. So I got pilot in two, um, 2000 and 
19, and that was a very complicated course with SNAP, with SNAP for Arduino, with physics and electrotechnical tasks. And at the end, it was too much for students. So feedback was too complicated, too much. And so I just reduced a little bit and did only a smart city paper course. Uh, with videos and programming tasks and tested this in different school types in Germany. We get, we've got a lot of different and this course is kind of for middle school. So I tested is in Realschule and gymnasium in different grades. And then between 2020, 2021, everyone knows a pandemic came and I was on the way to make my course digital so I could still do my course last school year I could do my course with my students and uh, two other colleagues did also my course. Um, at the end it is a digital course with programming tasks, videos, uh, self-control tests, H5P content and so on. And the next round should uh, come this autumn. So after this autumn, about November, I would have a uh, um course for everyone to um teach i just wanted to show you a par pictures of the process that was round one you see a lot of uh Arduino, not very much of snap but that was a combination then i switched in round two to a very complicated mathematical model with uh working with uh, mathematical functions in snap and students said oh no it's also too complicated <laughs> please do don't do uh, this to us. And I also, and now I just make a short film of my course. I hope I can start it. Yes. So you just can see um, how it looks like at the moment. Um, oops. So you see at the moment, it is a very big variation of different um, versions of um, giving an input for a student. There are a lot of videos and tasks and text and um, step exercises and so on. Um, at the moment, there are about 20 units to the basics of programming. And it is still my interdisciplinary context of programming this simulation. I've got some of control tests. I would put a little bit more control tests to the end version. And now I'm working on putting the whole course. At the moment, this is a commercial platform. Uh, I would like to put it on Moodle. And from November, it will be available actually for everyone. So if you are interested in such kind of a course, even in German, um, I can give an access to you so you can use it also in school after November. And um, yes, so you can find a little bit more information on our side of our research group. Or if you want to get an access for this course for every student of middle school, you can write me on my email and I would give you an access, I think timeline about November or December. So for a second school year or probably for a new lockdown, it can be probably an interesting variation of um, teaching. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. It's uh, it's always really exciting to see the different ways that SNAP makes it into the classroom and all the supporting scaffolding around it. Um, that was great. All right. This brings us to our last uh, lightning talk, which is um, an eccentric text editor 
uh, where it'll be presented by uh, Samo. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, I have um, pre-recorded my, my talk, so I will try now to, to launch it, okay? <laughs> okay. Awesome. Hello, Snappers. How are you? Do you hear it? Thank you for giving me an opportunity to yes. share with you my yes. simple, fun text editor. My name is Samo, and this is my hometown on a photo you can Google or DuckDuckGo. Triple break. Name of the city, let alone if I should actually. Ljubljana. So just remember, Ljubljana, Ljubljana. And this is a super safe town. You can sit back and relax and enjoy the great food, the great sights, the great back streets to go explore. It's really cool. Have you ever heard of Bravo, the text editor for Xerox Alto Personal Computer made in 1974? Did you read its 1976 manual? It introduced the mouse, a small white box usually placed to the right of the keyboard. Adele Goldberg, she talks about it, too. And now our little text editor, made in Snap. It can render text on a rotating paper. It can render text, left and right to an image. It animates a word deletion. There's undo button too. And fast typing mode. Here's an older version, showing font resizing. And column width. What's going on under the hood? And back to the Bravo, here's a fun video about it. Enjoy and thank you for your attention. Our first demonstration will be of the pioneering... These sheets of paper contained a, a rough, very rough sketch of a future editor for the auto. The selection, D deleted everything, <laughs> and, uh, and the I inserted the rest of your text. But fortunately, we, we had undo. Can you we do, do that, please? I'll undo it, Charles. I'll undo. undo. So no, we don't even have that. Unfortunately, undo worked only on one, uh, for one command. So I think... Wait, 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 wait. You were really host. Wait, 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 wait. I, I have one, one last way to recover here. So I'm going to exit the Bravo program and we had a feature which is also I think quite unusual historically. It's called the replay feature. So I'm going to restart Bravo in replay mode and it is actually keystroke by keystroke going to re re recreate my session. So it's reading in the uh, template. It's inserting my name. Okay, this is scripts for the um, for the text editor um, projects. I have connected them with this um, diagram connectors. Uh, every broadcast uh, block has a, a connection. You can replace this text with any text you wish. I have borrowed the native English speaker's deep voice from the free demo of Microsoft Text to Speech AI service offered by Azure, choosing Eric's voice. Keystroke by keystroke. Okay, th this is it. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, thank you. It was a very cool extension of Yen's typewriter. And as you can see from the comments, it was quite the hit. If you could share the YouTube video, that would be great. And of course, yes. the project, the SnapCon collection. Nice work. Okay. Thank you. And with that, uh, we're going to be going into a break now, again, until um, 12.
uh, Pacific time, and then we'll be starting another uh, round of uh, talks and panels and stuff. All right, so thank you again to everybody, and uh, see you um, at the next talks, and maybe maybe in the break at the hallway or or places like that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brian.